I love that. Now, one thing that you you were talking about, like that that speed increase or you know getting off the mound. Um, let's talk about that hurry up and wait like process. When you start with a pitcher, like I always tell them, we're gonna we're gonna start writing your song. Like I'm very metaphorically speaking when I coach, and we're gonna start off very simple. We're gonna have a very simple melody. And now I have a handful of pictures where I'm like, okay, now we understand what it truly means to be on the ball of our foot. Mm -hmm. So now we're gonna start coming up with the chorus, you know? So I used to be a pitcher. I think it was my junior year. I would, up until my junior year of high school, I would come down and I would slap my leg and then go through my pitch. And oh. my high school coach was like, hey, let's just quiet it down. That's a lot of energy. Oh my like, God. Okay. And so fight it down and I ended up junior year that year I made the change I hit 63 miles per hour and I was like holy cow like but I was kind of mad because I wasn't trying to peak like I wanted to have a gradual <laughs> and, you know but um uh, the one reference I like the metaphor I use is don't be a shotgun shell like a shotgun shell everything's out everywhere but a bullet is directly on yes. and so like, do you, in your training, thank you, um, can't take full credit for it. Uh, another one of my girls, rugged softball, Jen Newman, yeah. she talks about, she loves the core. She loves getting girls to feel the explosion of their core. And her analogy was taking um, a can of pop, soda pop, and shaking it up and opening it. She's like, that's how explosive you want to be. Yeah. So you don't want to physically do all these things with your body and then it, and expect to explode. You want to stay in that moment and then do your thing. And if you watch any of her pictures, any of her videos, it's very, I always tell one of my girls, like, I love putting classical music when I'm watching you guys pitch on video, like over, over doing the, the music with classical. I just, I want to see it that smooth, that sequencing, you know? So my question is, when you are starting out and you're getting them to understand the anatomy of the pitch, like when do you start to allow them if they're like, Hey coach, you know, I saw this and I would like to try this out. Like when you allow them to kind of start putting their signature piece onto their pitch. So I would say for the first thing that I, what, regardless of age or level, when I see a new student, the first thing we always start with is whip. Because to me, that is one of the biggest foundations of your pitch. I have seen a lot of really funky mechanics out there. I have a point to this, I promise. With <laughs> um, funky mechanics out there that like I personally would not encourage. Um, be those pitchers have been okay and still successful because they have really good fast whip. So in a sense, really good whip can compensate in a way for other mechanical issues. I have like a slew of examples for college pitchers that I know have really good whip with like other kind of strange mechanics and they're still really successful. Um, like ones that I watch on TV. Oh yeah. So once that looks really sad, like what, like, because that's also a really big part of injury prevention, understanding the whip and making sure you're really, truly nice and loose and not stiff. That's going to make sure your arm doesn't get injured. And we want like longevity of the arm. So once the whip is looking really solid and once I feel like they have a solid understanding of what each stage of the pitch is supposed to look like. So they, you know, when they throw a pitch, they land nice and balanced. They're not falling off in different directions. They aren't like pushing the ball when they deliver. They're not leaping, they're not crow hopping. Once I feel like they can really like command a fastball with a relaxed and healthy motion, and they're, you know, hitting that strike zone, because that's the other thing. You can throw as hard as you want, but if you're not hitting that 17 inch square, it really does not matter how hard right. you throw. Um, so they're commanding their fastball. They look loose. And one of my favorite phrases is the best pitchers look effortless. Um, they look relaxed. They feel good. Then I would allow them to, 
you know, kind of try different things um, within reason. Cause again, if they're like, I'd like to try, you know, opening my hips too early in the reach, I'd be like, nope. <laughs> Can't yeah, I'm not a fan of that. Idea. I Amazing. remember, I can't remember who the pitcher was, but it was a D1 pitcher who did that. This is probably within seven years. And all of a sudden you started seeing all these little pitchers turning their hips and doing all. And I'm like, stop, like yeah. you are not broken. You don't need to fix it. And you're, you're literally comparing your beginning or your middle to their end. Like yes. Yes. you are 12 and they are, you know, 18, 19, 20, 21. Like they have a totally different body makeup. Yeah. You have to understand what, what the mechanics, what healthy mechanics look like. Yes. And then when you have an understanding of that, you can safely figure out what works best for you. Like what works for your body type for your, you know, again, if you're that pitcher that maybe has scoliosis that you don't know about, if you our pitcher who has had a past injury, things that you have to work with, but you definitely need to understand what the healthy and optimal mechanics look like. So once I see that, like if I have a, a young pitcher who is, or any pitcher that, you know, just looks nice and relaxed, they're commanding the strike zone uh, with their fastball. And obviously after that would be a change up before we even consider mm -hmm. any, which is like, for me, you have to learn a change up. Yeah. Um, then I would allow them to kind of like play around. And I do that a lot with my girls, especially with like pre-motions and loads. Mm -hmm. is I say something, I'm like, you understand what the, so whenever I look at the four stage of pitch, when I talk about the load, I'm talking about that end stage load position, that moment right before you push off the rubber, that's the load position. Everything that happens prior to that is what I consider the pre-motion. So, mm -hmm. and every, I don't think I've ever seen two pitchers have like the exact same pre-motion. Mm -hmm. So what I tell my girls is you need to find some kind of pre-motion that allows you to feel relaxed while at the same time allows you to feel like you're building momentum and still allows you to get to that end stage load position. One of the biggest issues that has arisen late, lately, I don't know if you've noticed this, is the new foot placement rule that has been put into place that's that like a couple of years ago that says the back foot no longer has to start touching with the rubber oh yeah right? yeah oh. and they introduced the start back and the step back mm -hmm. i the other biggest thing that i always have to correct in the video analyses is not having like a mile between your feet because this new rule was introduced and everyone is taking it to the extreme. Mm -hmm. They're either like stepping three feet back or they're just starting three feet back. And what they don't realize is that when your feet are in this position, it is pretty much impossible to get to that end stage, lo stage load position. And when you can't get to that end stage load position, now you're not accessing the correct muscle groups to drive straight outwards off forever. So what's gonna happen? You're gonna open mm -hmm. or you're gonna push up instead of out all of these things that are gonna break down mechanics. So that's the other big thing I have to correct. But what I usually say to my girls is, find some kind of pre-motion that makes you feel loose and relaxed. You're still using your feet. You're still getting into that good load position. So you can access all those correct muscles to get the hip extension, to get the leg drive, to drive straight out off the rubber before you open up, not open too early. Yeah. And that really is, you know, I'll help them if they ask me for, I'll be like, like if you like, well, do you think I should do something different here? But for their pre-motions, I really kind of, I'll make my recommendations. And then I tell them that they kind of really need to do what feels best for them. Yeah. Um, I, yeah. So that's, I agree that's really with that. Cool. Um, it's funny. You mentioned that the step back rule. Um, I remember Amanda Scarborough had made a video when it first came out and she like went through it all. And so I sent it to all my pitchers and I was like, Hey, we're going to start tapping in. We're going to see, you know, if you want to create that buy-in on the movement, you don't have to change what you're doing is not illegal. Um, and I had one of my girls, she, she really did well with starting on and then stepping off and they went out to Utah to the AFA nationals and she kept getting called for an illegal pitch. So really? she called me and I was like, no, 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 no. We'll come to find out per that ordained organization or whatever um during that time they only allowed two you could start with both feet on or you could start with your your pull foot back 
you could not start on and come back. Yeah. So I do, I wasn't aware for ASA. I thought, I oh, know that AFA. Like, AFA. Oh, AFA. Sorry, I thought you said yeah, ASA. You're good. I know for, for like PGF and Alliance and college, Mm -hmm. only start back. You cannot do that step back. And that's actually a big reason why I always usually highly advise against the step back mm -hmm. because one, it seems silly. Like if you have goals ultimately to play in college one day, it seems silly to put that into your muscle memory to me to have to get rid of it later. And also the step back is primarily where I see the too big of a stance. Yeah. And they lose, uh, they almost lose their footing. Yes. And it's taking you in a direction away from where you want to be going. So I always, always highly advise against the step back, but that's interesting. I, I would have thought that it would have been allowed. There. No. And it was weird because it was within that yeah. year that all the changes took place. And so after that, I just pulled the plug. I was like, nobody else is doing the step back. <laughs> we're either on the mound or we're our foot's back. Yeah. And, and I do um, like the, the, within reason <laughs> i think the start back is a good thing because it does allow you to get a little bit into a deeper load but it's when you start to take it too far back right. that it a lot of issues and well, part of me has been like why did we change the rule <laughs> i know like and then why can't we just all keep it the same like yeah i was watching my daughter before she started playing officially up at 14 years she was picking up for our 14 u organization team and I went to go watch her and this pitcher was, um, leaping. <sighs> I was like slow mo. Slow. And it, Jill, it looked so painful because her leg, her, her foot was literally like flailing on the backside of her pitch, banging into the ground. And I'm just like, so I brought it to the director's booth and had a really good conversation, got educated. Uh, U trip does everything that NCAA does. Um, but the head umpire was like, you are very fortunate to have been taught healthy mechanics and you are very blessed to continue teaching healthy mechanics. Basically, yes. he was telling me he doesn't agree with it. And, and she did great. Like she came in there and shut the game down on us. But at the same time, I'm over there like trying to see into her future. Mm -hmm. And I'm like, it doesn't look very bright. Yeah. Like it's the leaping and the crow hopping is really frustrating to my girls. It's frustrating to other coaches. It's frustrating to me because we, you know, you and I take the time to teach the correct healthy mechanics. And when it's not called on other pitchers who are leaping in games, it's like, you know what I mean? But I think there's also, for me, leaping and crow hopping is caused by mechanical breakdown. Exactly. Mechanical breakdown is going to take away from your command. It's going to take away from your speed. It's going to increase your chance of injury. So it's not simply just getting called in games. I think everyone's like, well, if I jump off the rubber, both my feet are up off the ground, like my pitch is going to be better. And it's actually not true. So they're setting themselves up, not only like when they get to the higher levels, when, you know, it gets called more, they're going to get called for it in the middle of the game. And they have a coach who has not bothered to fix that issue. So now they're going to be stuck in the middle of the game, getting constantly called on an illegal pitch, illegal pitch, illegal pitch. And they're going to have no clue what causes that leap or how to fix it. So now they're stuck in the middle of a game and they're getting frazzled. They're like, I need to just throw strikes and keep my foot on the ground. And I have no idea how to do that. They end up getting pulled because they can't or they keep getting called on it. Right. And as you get to the higher levels and you're fully developed now, again, you're at greater chance for injury plateauing. So it's, it's like killer to me that all these, because I see it everywhere. I I'm fortunate enough where like all the teams that my girls play for do like live streams on game mm -hmm. change and yes. HD and athletes go live. So I'm always watching. That's like one of the, you know, I do more than just like teach my girls how to pitch, which is why I would say I like see fewer girls at a time than most coaches. I also don't have like a big facility. So like, I just no, have I get it. Yeah. Um, but I also like, I see all of my girls once a week and I also take them through the entire recruiting process. I watch their live streams so that I can like give them feedback at the end of the day and be like, look, here's what I saw. Like make sure it's so, like, if they were feeling off, like, here's what I saw every and like the parents it's always the parents of my girls they'll text me like jill 
this <laughs> other creature is leaping and no one is calling yep. it and crow hopping and they're like so mad and I don't blame them because their daughter works hard to make sure that she is doing the correct mechanics and this other pitcher is just not and and you know nothing's being said but in the end they're going to be better off for it because they won't get injured they're going to be throwing harder with better command but I see it everywhere oh everywhere. yeah they always like that. my girls that have worked with me they'll run up to me like at tournaments where maybe my daughter's team is playing because I volunteer with her uh, team as a coach and other pitchers will be there. And they're like, coach, 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 you got to come up here. You got to come up here. Watch this watch <laughs> pitching illegally. And I'm like, yeah, nobody's saying anything about it. And so it sucks, but I do use it as it's a control, the controllable. It like, is. You stay yeah. in your lane. And, and like, it's been so bad that we went to New Mexico and played and that they actually, it was so dirty. We were playing 12U. They let a 16U player, and I'm not going to say the, the name of the, the softball company, um, but they let a 16U player come in and pitch. And so I reached out to my girl, Coach Sandy. Yeah, well, pitch. the, the jump from it was the terrible. Like, I could have put a jersey on and went out there. Like, that's how ridiculously ran it was to the point where we complained about it and we got told uh we don't play until eight o'clock the next morning and everybody our coaches like go back you know relax you know get dinner go watch a movie do something you know and we get a call at I think it was like 6 30 and they were like hey where are you at coach to our head coach and he's like what are you talking about we don't play till eight and they're like, nope, you guys are on, on the clock at seven. And he was like, no way. So they basically like pushed us out. They bullied us out of the tournament because we were being so firm on what you just did was bull crap. Yeah. And so we, we flat out said never again, will we play in that particular organization, that company ever in New Mexico. Like, we're just like, sorry for you. And like, we have video, we, we, um, my coach's wife, like wrote everything up, emailed it to the head honchos and nobody's doing anything about it. And they're wondering why travel ball is getting such a bad rap. And, and it's the same in high school because down here, girls are like, I don't want to play high school ball. Like it's not competitive. It is insane to me what it's like travel ball and high school ball is now being treated as if it's like college or professional Ball. And, and you know they're laughing at the college and, level they're laughing at that. I know I know and it is insane to me what these like coaches will do to just win a game cheat severely this is a From big issue down, like, yes this is a big big issue that I'm running through with every single one of my girls right now is overuse severe severe overuse one of my girls just pitched Att like t attending in game, attending in game one to extra innings. She pitched the full game the next day. She pitched a full game Saturday and part of a second game on Saturday. So we're talking at least 300. Probably Pitching. more. Probably yeah, more because her team also makes a lot of errors, which is very common in high school. You know, you're not going to yeah. get that level of play that you yeah. would in travel ball. And, you know, we have talked to the coach many times, like, hey, you can't do this. This is true. She's got summer season coming up. You could have the world's best mechanics in the world. If you are being over pitched, fatigue is going to set in. And when fatigue sets in, mechanics break down. And that's when injuries happen. Yes. Yep. And that's when injuries happen. And he just doesn't care. He doesn't. No, let's, not let's talk about that. Cause I get that is a, that, you know, I think for you and I, because, we're never just coaching and then we're done. It's we'll get a new age group, you know, new age as one goes out, one comes in kind of scenario. And it, we almost feel like, gosh, dang it. I'm always talking about this. Well, it's the profession we chose. Right. <laughs> um, so with that, like I get asked a lot, why can, why isn't there a pitch count on softball and there is in baseball and it's like, okay, let's break the mechanics down. This, this is why now do you think there should be? I do. I do think there should be because like you just said, you nailed it on the head. When fatigue kicks in, that's when injury creeps in. And you cannot, when you're at that point of fatigue, you can't prevent it. Yep. Like it's already waiting to happen. Yes. And these coaches, they do not care. No. And these 
all this is happening to my 2025s. And this is a huge summer coming up for my 2025s because come September, the college yep. coaches will be calling yep. on September 1st. And if they miss out on this summer season because their high school coach did not care about the health of their arm and over them and now they have an injury, that's not good. No. And it's it's very, very frustrating for me. I've been like, let me talk to your coach. And they won't oh yeah. I'm like, here's my card. Here's my afraid of me. <laughs> like I will stand in the gap for you because this is bull crap. Yeah. It's like, terrible. They, these, like they care and not only pitch counts, but you should be required. Here's the other issue. These high level pitchers that we teach are very often quite literally considered the only pitcher on the team. So they're like, well, but we don't have another pitcher. I don't care. Grab somebody and have them pitch. If you lose, that's fine. Ooh. Like you have to care about, and not just pitchers. I'm sure there are other players who are, you know, playing every single inning that's of right. every single game, never get a break and they get hurt as well. You have to care about the health of your players over winning. You have to. And these travel ball coaches, these high school coaches, for the most part, because my girls happen to have absolutely wonderful travel ball coaches who like I talk to and I adore. Mm -hmm. um, but these high school coaches especially have to stop caring so much about their winning record and their stats and place more of a focus on the health of their girls and the future of their girls. Cause like I said, these 20.5s are heading into a really important summer season. And I bet there are going to be a lot of them who are injured. Well, and they're, they're like, they know that. And so parents will be like, well, I'm not even going to have my daughter play. Like for right. real, for real, my daughter, she's a seventh grader. She goes to an amazing school. It's literally, they start at seven 30, they get out 12 30, it's five hours. And it's for, wow middle schoolers, it's public school. So it feeds into the public school system, but they get out, they get shipped to facilities to train like gymnasts, swimmers. I mean, other baseball players, she's, she does oh, softball. Cool. So I'll pick her up. She comes to the house. She has her hitting routine. She hits, she fields, and then she reads for 15 minutes, like a book on hitting. Um, and then we really focus on pitching when she's with me. Right. So she gets shipped over to the facility a couple of days out of the week. And that way she can at least see her ball travel you know? So I love that she's able to do that. But the biggest thing was, okay, if you don't go to a regular middle school, you're not going to be able to play the middle school sports. And she's like, I don't care because even if I was in middle school, I'm not telling my pitch. Yeah. Because I've had girls like, in fact, it's funny. We're on this. I had a girl that was with me last year. She was coming to my training and we really, she's very long boned. I don't know about you, Jill, but I have found that more long boned pitchers are more like they want to throw hello elbow. I don't know what it is with um, that. that. I just, yeah. What I've just noticed is that when you have the very, very tall, thin yes. girl where like you can look at them and be like, this girl probably does not have an ounce of muscle on her body. Yes. yes. They're more prone to injury. And they're just, they, they just, they seem to not have as much control over their body. Right. Uh, because of that. It's like a baby deer, you know? <laughs> yeah. No, but it, and this is where we're at with her. Yeah. So I met her and her mom to pick up my daughter after I got done training last night after practice. And she's like, I think I may have torn my labor. Oh, she no. didn't be afraid. Uh. But honestly, I can go back to the night where I was talking to her mom last year after a middle school game saying, Hey, is she okay? Because I found out that she pitched 121 pitches in a middle school game because she's the only pitcher. I'm like, okay, because of that, now we're dealing with this prolonged lifetime. Oh you she'll, she'll get repaired and she'll have physical therapy and you know, she'll feel okay. But once you have an injury like that, even after it's repaired, that area is always going to be going to be a like, trigger. It's going to be a yeah. trigger. It's going to have a weakness and it's never going to be exactly the same as it was before. And it's just, I cringe the number of like fast pitch power plus submissions I got of nine and 10 year olds already struggling with shoulder issues. One of them had a torn labrum. One of them had, you know, 
uh, ten, bicep tendonitis. There was another one. What was it? Like a bunch of thoracic outlet syndromes, like torn rotator cuff. There was a nine-year-old with a torn rotator cuff. And I was like, in what world are we teaching mechanics where a nine-year-old is going to get a torn rotator cuff? It is unacceptable, like unacceptable to me that that is even. That is nuts. Cause I just, I always tell my girls, like, especially the ones that are coming in with improper, like unhealthy, like debilitating mechanics. Right. I tell them like, you are going to feel like you're in France because everything you're about to endure over the next four weeks, because they'll come into an evaluation course with me. One to decide if I like them Two to decide if they like me, I got to make sure we have coaching chemistry, right? I got to make sure you're listening and you're actually applying what we're doing. And when I tell them that they're like, what do you mean? It's going to feel foreign. And I'm oh, like, yeah. I feel like that's I another, I'm, I'm really glad you brought that up. Cause I feel like that's another big thing pa- that mostly I feel like parents get concerned about. So they might have a pitcher who had like really bad mechanics, hello elbow and was throwing a certain speed. Like maybe they're throwing 52 miles an hour. And when they first start learning the new mechanics, sometimes, usually we see a pickup in speed, usually, because if you pick it up quickly and you're doing it correctly, whip is always going to be faster than, than, you know, other mechanics, like the porn, like the incorrect mechanics. Sometimes a pitcher has a hard time grasping it and they're getting used to it. Like you said, it feels foreign and they actually lose a few miles per hour before they gain it. And that is like a real big trigger because the coaches, parents, pitchers like, well, I'm losing speed. So this isn't working. Yep. They need to understand that. No, you need to break down this old mess of muscle memory and build up the new ones. And that Mm -hmm. can feel really weird. You're not used to it. You're learning it. And you might take a step back before you step forward. Again, usually we pretty quickly see increases but there are instances where the pitcher loses speed before they like really gain a lot when they're like more comfortable with it and you know it feels more natural to them and not so foreign so that's really yeah no if we were to do like kind of like what chiropractors do like they'll do a range of motion check on you before they start adjusting you like consistently if we were able to do a range of motion test or have some kind of scale to be like, oh my gosh, yes, you're getting slower, but look at, look at your, look at the, de- the degree of your drive now, you know, yeah. like look at how your elbow and your leg, I love using the communication factor on that track side of the pitch. Like you should not be here and your leg be bent or your leg straight and your arm be here. They should be 20. They should be talking to each other. Mm-hmm. And That's when true. I start to see that happen, like I'll always screenshot it and I'm like, look at you growing, yes. you know? Just yeah. little nuggets like that. But yeah, that's, that's big down here. Um, I actually had a client who reached out, wanted to work with me. Um, and I always do like the calls, like let's set up a free game plan call. You know, let's just make sure. Cause I need to tell you what I'm going to expect of you. And it, it, I'm ambiguous. It could be a little too much for you, you know? Um, but she's like, well, you would be my third pitching coach in two years. And I'm like, hold the phone, hold the phone. Like, I need to know what's going on. Because if you are the problem, I am not going to fix it. Yeah. You know, if you are the one who is refusing to do what's being asked of you and come to find out she's not the problem. It was, there were no specific drills to do, to understand how to do the mechanics, like being given to her. It was just like, just throw a strike, just throw a strike. Like down Uh, here, there's, you know. I, I need to be nice about this, but <laughs> one thing sometimes like I try to, but sometimes I'm like, I just can't, <laughs> it, it kills me when I see like, or, or girls will reach out to me. Hey, my pitching coach hasn't called me for two weeks. Why hasn't your pitching coach called you for two weeks? Like you should be pitching once a week with your pitching coach. Like I was doing that 25 plus years ago with my pitching coach. I mean, this is like this is an old school thing and it's still here. It's prevalent. Right. And well, my parents are, you know, wanting to, they want me to start working with you because that's one thing that everybody talks about is how coach Callie is working with their athletes once a week. Yeah. 
And high school season, it's always really tricky because we have the Arizona Interscholastic Association rules where they can't work with anybody affiliated with their team. It's just strictly one-on-one. -on -one. Oh yeah. <laughs> so like we do a lot of Zoom sessions and they're throwing into their bow net or their nine square, which is fine, or their dad's catching them, but it's always yeah. tricky with their schedule, but we always do check-ins. And so I just say, well, you're not going to work with me so you can keep my gas tank full. Mm -hmm. So I tell them, I'm like, you're going to work with me because you want to play college ball. Like that's a big degree of separation for me down here is if yeah. you don't have the desire to play, then I'm going to drive you nuts. I cannot agree with you more on that because I'm at the, when I very first started giving lessons, it was really kind of at the point where like, you know, you're building yourself up initially and you really take anybody. Cause like, well, I have to, you know, get the word out and stuff. But now I am very blessed to be at a point where I can kind of pick and choose who I work yep. with because there is nothing worse than that situation where it's so clear that the parent wants them to pitch and the girl has absolutely no interest in being there. Oh yeah. They don't listen. They're not paying attention. They don't practice on their own. And I'm like, I would rather you, like, I would rather like you not, like, I don't want your money. Like I want right. a girl who is passionate about this. And right now the group of girls that I work with, I adore, like they were like my sisters, all of them. Like they, I, like, they are the best. They are all passionate. They work so hard, like hard to the point where I have to like text them and be like, make sure you take your day off. Like yes. make sure Interesting. and they all have goals to play at like the highest level they're all super passionate but it's not always like that especially when you're first starting out you get the girls who are bored with the drills and just want to go back to the rubber and try to throw as hard as they can and the girls who don't want to be there but their parents want them to be mm -hmm. there and it's like really difficult the girls who are like will just start like breaking down or like getting so mad at themselves if they throw a single bad pitch. Mm -hmm. It's like really challenging when like that's kind of all you have available to you. But when you get to that point, when you have the girls who are passionate about it and the parents are like, oh, my group of parents are like so amazing. Yeah. And it's, it's like the best job in the world. I feel it like. is, it truly is. And and I found that each time there's something like a sticky situation, I just, just roll with it. And God blesses me with somebody who actually wants to be a part of it, you know, and it's like, it's all good. You know, I have to look at it like that. And it's weird because when you start doing it, you're like, I want to help everyone. And then you realize you can't help everyone. You can actually help the ones that want to help. Yep, yeah, exactly. And but I'm sure your dad explains that. <laughs> That is one of my things that I always say to any parent, any pitcher. I said, I would always rather work with like, like if you gave me a girl who was super athletic, but had no passion, didn't want to be there to a girl who like maybe wasn't as athletic, needed more work on the mechanics, but was like, I want this so bad and I'm willing to put in the work. Give me that girl every day. Heck like yeah. I, I, I eat that, that mental part of pitching that drive, that desire, that confidence, that is to me sometimes even more important than the mechanics. Always, because honestly, that's when they're done throwing, that's what's gonna stick around. Exactly. That's exactly. like, we're, I don't know, I had a friend who was always like, you're more than just a pitching coach. You are a mentor to my daughter. Like, I was like, holy cow. So yeah, and it's just, those little nuggets, like um, CJ Beatty always talks about the motivational nuggets. And uh, he's great. Yeah, he's awesome. And I'm just like, oh, yeah, like, I didn't even realize I was saying that, like, control the controllables one pitch at a time. Like, do you realize how many places we can take that type of mentality into our life? Into our life. And there is, I mean, being a mentally tough pitcher, to me, like, I'm biased, but being a pitcher to me is probably the toughest position on the field because not only are you involved in every single play of every single game but once you let go of the ball not only like okay i have to execute my pitch i have to make sure it's spun right i have to make sure it hit its spot its location i've got good speed now i have to make sure i can feel the ball in case it gets hit back at me so i'm also a fielder 
Sometimes right. I hit as well, you know? So there's so many and being able to manage all that and still like be emotionally stable, <laughs> like mentally stable yes. is a very hard thing to do, but is also a really great life skill. Like you said, to be able to handle all that pressure in other aspects of life, as well as pitching. So Heck yeah, no, that's, that's true. So with that, we're going to get ready to close this down. Um, but I just wanted to kind of talk about, you know, we did talk about like injury can, I don't, I guess, adapt your mechanics until you're out of that. But like your senior year of high school, you tore a tendon in your throwing wrist. Cartilage, actually, it was actually my junior. I was wrong. So there were a couple things that happened to me, like one, and they were both non-pitching related injuries. And to me, that's the most frustrating kind oh. of injury. It's like <laughs> hurt, and it wasn't even from pitching. Yeah, I didn't even make um, a play, and I, I got hurt, like. So the first one, I actually had nerve damage in my forearm and it was from, a, we were meeting in a circle, like in between the inning and I went to high, five, this is going to sound really weird. I went to high five, one of my teammates and my catcher's helmet, like the edge of my catcher's helmet was right here. And my forearm smacked down on it. And I immediately like felt weird. And then like the next day I noticed that there was like a lump, like it felt like my bone, like there was a lump. Mm -hmm. And so I, I was like, this is really weird. Like, it's really bothering me. Like I would pitch and it would feel like weird. Like my hand would start to tingle. Mm -hmm. And I went to the doctor and was like, you have like this little bone growth there and it's pushing on a nerve. So I had to do all this like PT and all this like nerve retraining, but it took a long time. And then the other thing that happened was during like, you know, one of those really cold days where like you make contact with the ball at bat and like, it just vibrates through your hand and yeah. it's awful that happened. And then I was sliding somewhere and just something happened to my wrist. I was starting to get terrible pain mm -hmm. on the pinky side of my pitching wrist, right? Like where your wrist meets your hand. Yep. I remember continuing to pitch through it. And after every time I would pitch, my hand would start like shaking, like uncontrollably. And it was so painful. And I got an MRI. This was, I think, my junior year. So I hadn't like committed. No, I had committed because junior year, again, back then, junior year, same as, as it yeah. is now, was when the coaches could start talking to you. Um, and it came up, it was called a TFCC tear, triangular fibrocartilage complex. Wow. From, from sliding. And I like a combination of just like the, the hitting and then sliding on it weird. And I was so nervous because one of the things that, um, attracted me to the, my coach was she was like, she's a very wristy pitcher. Um, so she liked that. I had like really good wrist snap and created a lot of spin on the ball. And I was like, I'm going to lose all my like wrist snap. It's like, so I'm never going to pitch the same again. I ended up having it repaired by this phenomenal surgeon. Um, I remember him, his name was Dr. Elon. He was in New York. He's incredible. And I got really, and my like physical therapist in that area, who to this day is still one of my favorite people in the world. Um, we really got it good as new. It felt good. But I remember going to on my dad's little dirt mound in his backyard and getting ready to pitch again. And I was just like, not like really putting a full effort in. My dad was like, what's going on? And I was like, I'm afraid. I'm afraid I'm going to hurt it again. And then I'm not going to be able to pitch. And he, like, you would expect like a dad to be like sympathetic, like, oh, like, it's going to be okay, honey. Like you'll get through this. He quite literally said to me, and I made a mental training video on this inside fast pitch power class. He said, if you're going to be afraid, you might as well not pitch. Yeah. Because if you're pitching afraid, you're never going to pitch as well as you could. You're just going to be afraid. So after that, I actually, you know, took his advice, went back to it. And I ended up, that was when I ended up hitting 70, 71 miles an hour in my next high school year. Um, I remember, cause my dad would tell me that like, some other coaches would stand behind the backstop with radar guns and they would like look at it and they were like hitting it like it was a wrong read <laughs> and the other guy staying there was like no that's what I got too <laughs> it's funny um so yeah I I always give that it's hard it's really hard obviously some girls are I mean it's unfortunate and I feel for them are get injuries to such a level that they're not able to come back and that's terrible 
Um, but when you have an injury and you've been cleared mentally, it is really challenging to come back and be confident because you're afraid of that pain again. Like nobody wants to be in pain no. um, and you're afraid. Like what if like all the, what ifs start to creep into your head? What if it hurts again? What if my spin isn't as good as you, anymore? What if I'm not throwing as hard? But like my dad said, if there's always those what ifs and that fear going through your head when you're out on the mound pitching, you're always going to be to an extent holding yourself back and you're never going to pitch as well as you could. So the video I actually made on it is called let go of fear. And you have to just, you have to trust that like your surgeons did a good job, your physical or your physical therapist did a good job and you have to just go and go for it. And that was really like the best thing he could have said to me, because I think if he had been one of those, like, oh, it's going to be okay. Like you're fine. I would have just been like, it's not okay. Yeah. <laughs> no. And, and that's huge. Cause I always like tell the, tell my girls, especially the girls that have any hesitation in sliding. Yeah. I'm like, bro, if you hesitate to slide, you're breaking your ankle. Like oh. it's so I, one of the coaches I've coached with in the past, he would always say hesitation causes devastation. And I would say in the game of softball, it always results in two things, an error or injury. Oh yeah. Or a so home run. Even allowing, yeah, yeah. That hesitation to come in, just go trust your instinct. You know, yeah. you've seen it anytime, like say there's a center fielder with an arm on her and she knows there's a play at home, but you see her hesitate. And then there's an error from that, but yeah. the next play she'll come back and not hesitate and she'll gun her out at home. Yep. Yeah. And, yep. And overthinking is one of the worst enemies of pitchers as well. My dad, the analogy he always gives is he'll have like, especially if a girl brings her catcher, like her game catcher to a, to a lesson. We love that by the way, like coaches always bring your catchers to like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Love that. so he'll go to the pitcher and be like, where's your brain when you're on the field? And they'll be like, Oh, you know, it's in my head. He's like, Nope. And then he walks over to the catcher and points to her head. He said, she, you know, like you should be aware of what's going on, but she's watching the field. She's going to ultimately like, well, now it's different because we have the wristbands and stuff and the coaches are calling the, uh, mm -hmm. I still think it needs to be taught though. Cause I agree. Yeah. I I'm, I've always been a fan of pitchers and catchers calling their own games, but, um, the catchers, you know, calling the pitches, the catchers, like communicating with everyone. So it's not, you know, the, the catcher standing up like, Hey, we got this many outs calling to everyone on the field. The pitcher's job is to execute. Don't think execute. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? Trust your mechanics. This is something I always say mm -hmm. to my girls because it's so easy to yep. want to slow, like slow down and aim the ball and get stiff or push the ball. Like in, in terms of a spin pitch, like instead of really spinning it and just let it go, just kind of guiding the ball to where you think it's supposed to go. I'm like, you know how to do this. Like trust your mechanics get out there and just throw it. Yep. We can think all you want during lessons. That's what lessons are for. We can think, we can think, talk think. about stuff. We can, you know, go over stuff. You get out of that game and your catcher thinks for you. And I love it when the catchers come to lessons because then they become aware of the mechanical issues that are like normal, like common for the mm -hmm. pitcher. And they become aware of like, oh, when she misses this spot, this is probably what happened. And they yep. can support each other and it's the best. But yeah, you got to trust the mechanics. You got to trust that after an injury that it's been fixed like it's supposed to and everything's going to be okay. Because when you get out on that mound, you just have to stop thinking and throw. Yeah. And, and it's like my girls, I always tell them there are no thoughts on the rubber. Like I, I give them the allowance of one thought. And that one thought is a trigger. It's before they step on the rubber. So I know for me to help me switch gears as a pitcher, like when I'm throwing a changeup, I tell myself hit the wall and then I get on the mound. And what that does is that triggers me to move so fast off the mound that as soon as I get to release point, I'm hitting the wall. And the ball comes out differently. Uh, drop ball I, before I step on the mound, up and over, rise yeah. ball. Yeah, it's like get under, snap. You know, like I have these trigger words that allow me to not even think, even though it's a one thought, but it triggers me to just move. I love that. Yeah, you know? that's good. Yeah, there should be things that you can do or say to yourself to like keep yourself relaxed or remind yourself of like what, like what's a little bit different from this pitch that I'm throwing from the previous one. Right. 
but like it's when the what ifs and the like oh no what if I miss this pitch yeah you know start to creep in that you you know you know I mean we have pitched against those cute little batters and typically the first thought that goes into our mind is oh my gosh she's so cute don't hit her and then what happens you know it's like (laughs) Simon Sinek said it best, like the whole elephant theory. I don't know if you watched that clip, but he talked about, Ashley uh, Burkhart talks about this too. But if I say, don't think about an elephant, you just thought about an elephant, yep. right? So oh don't introduce gosh. any negative thought in, in right before you're getting ready to execute. It manifests itself. Man, That's and it was just amazing because he talks about how your brain cannot wrap itself around the negativity so you'll you'll literally go into a loop yep. and you won't get out of it but if you if you just focus on what your job is as a pitcher and know that batters are going to come in all shapes or sizes on each side of the plate your focus is that glove your focus is that catcher she makes you look good and you make her look good it's That's an awesome. inverse relationship a good catcher make any pitcher instantly better without the pitcher having to do like an ounce of work it's- yep hundred percent. I love it. Well, I don't want to take any more of your time and I know your daughter's probably going to start waking up and like, yeah, she's probably going to be super grumpy. It's fine. Okay. <laughs> but, uh, know. Oh yeah. She's just coughing a lot. So she wakes up, but no, it's all good. I truly appreciate you like allowing me to <laughs> bring you into the podcasting world. For the first time i'm excited um, this was so fun i'm gonna have to get your i'm gonna have to get both of you and your dad on right okay. first of all it's gonna have to be like if you want phil it's gonna have to be an eye round because like i said if there was like, a person who had absolutely no clue about any kind of technology it would be my dad <laughs> but he would love love to do this like i said his head is gonna get so big to know that we've like talked about him so much today but, i mean i'm out in the southwest and that that's how big of like a pull your dad has i refer people to his youtube videos and then when i started seeing you kicking stuff out i was like i don't know i mean she does resemble him like there are some similar characteristics like i i don't know if that's i would last my dad's like fairly tall my mom's like very short like very short italian lady um i got my mom's face and my dad's height so, <laughs> um, and I'm, I'm glad that I got the height. <laughs> well, it's definitely the physical, like I see, I've studied your dad's videos enough. And then when I started seeing you, I was like, she like has the same like coaching characteristics. Like when she's telling somebody to do a drill, it, she, she looks a lot like Phil, like it's gotta be her dad. So it's that's so funny. so funny how many people don't know that though. Like, no, when- they don't. Yeah. yeah. It's my dad. So <laughs> I have awesome. to give a shout out to my sister too because she does all the behind the scenes stuff. She designed our website. She did everything. So now, what's your sister's name? Carly. Carly. Three years older than me. Yep. She also lives in New York, but she and she used to give lessons here or there, but she kind of stepped away from that. She has another job now too. But as like everything you see online, that is fast pitch power. Like I run the social media pages, but the website, the design of our app and stuff. That was all my sister. Oh, so nice. we're all, we're a fast pitch power family. <laughs> I love that. No, you guys need to get out this way. Like I, I, I know from PR3, she's like, I want to come to a clinic with you. Like, I would love to have you guys out here. Obviously not now because we're getting ready to be in the 110, 117. I mean, but I work out of an indoor facility. Um, but like during the fall time, it's absolutely beautiful out here. But, I would love that. I've actually never been to Arizona, so I would like to get out that way. My parents have been there, but I would like to get out there, so I would love to do a clinic. When my kids also are able to not like come and terrorize everybody. You're good. All my kids grew up here. <laughs> Between my husband and I, because he's a head baseball coach, and we've both been coaches for like, like I don't know, 98% of their life. I was a coach before I had kids. Like, they all were potty trained like you know we'd ask one of the players hey can you run them in while i'm doing this you know like all these (laughs) you have amazing i keep my fingers crossed every day that at least one of my kids wants to play some kind of sport it'd be great my like dream is to see them both like playing catch with each other outside of the backyard 
But uh, even if they don't, that's okay. But I'd love to get them at least involved in this. Oh, yeah. Just get them around there. They're, they're, my kids are three and one. And whenever, a lot of times, my, the majority of my lessons are online. Mm -hmm. But they come to visit me. They'll fly in to come visit me. And like when my son sees like my lessons, he's like, hi. And they like gives him a big hug. So it's like the like sh showing them the girls that I work with and the girls that I work with seeing them. It's like really cool because it almost makes it feel like they're part of the family. Oh yeah, no, they are. They're watching your kids grow up. Like it's it's a pretty cool thing that happens and um, it's legacy work. Like you're leaving something behind after they're done working with you. They're they're gonna carry on what you taught them and you don't, you're not doing it through ego. You're doing it through love. Yep, absolutely. Yeah. So. Absolutely. Big difference. <laughs> Big difference, All right. for sure. Thank you so much Thank for your time. You. Thank you so much for having me. It was a ton of fun. Hopefully I can get out there soon. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. <laughs> <laughs>